Hello, everyone. I'm joined today with um, Bill Gerrards. I'm um, Gerrards. Or oh, Gerrards. I keep Gerrards. getting it wrong, but I'm sure he'll uh, point it right. Just, so just Stick to Bill for the rest of the thing. You'll be fine. Bill, from um, Armageddon Expo, Expo here in New Zealand, and also from uh, Beyond Media. Is it uh, it's Beyond Media? Am I right, getting it right? The, essentially, we needed a company name that covered everything. Beyond we Reality were Media. Beyond Reality Media. All right. That covers, that's the, the Armageddon. We, we own the Armageddon Expo name as a company, but as our parent, our parent company is Beyond Reality Media, just because it covers everything that we Excellent. do. So. Awesome. All right. So with that, um, Bill, please take it away. Um, tell us about yourself. Give us a bit of our bio, and then we'll hit the big, big questions after that. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I don't know, just turned 50 last year. It was a lovely birthday during COVID where we didn't get to do anything. Um, I've been a nerd since I was, I don't know, 12 or earlier. Um, I've been in the, in and out of comics um, since I was about 16. Um, I've been in and out of sci-fi pretty much forever. Um, and when I was... Uh, when I was in my early 20s, I got involved in the Doctor Who fan club, and then that branched into me running some video days, and that branched into me running some sort of fantasy events, and that branched into me running, uh, creating Armageddon 27 years ago. Um, oh, wow. And we've been, yeah, 27 years. Um, next weekend show, depending on when you're watching this, this is the weekend before the June show, um, is our 100th event. Which was supposed to take place last year, and then obviously yeah. we moved things to move things around. But uh, yeah, so um, and that's pretty much been my life for the last you know quarter of a decade. So long, half of my life, over half of my life, working on Armageddon. Um, I got four kids. I got a couple of grandchildren now. I got too many cats. One of them's sitting over there, sort of just sleeping, and a, and a dog. Um, I live in Christchurch. I moved down right. here about a year before the earthquake, so about twelve years ago, okay. um, which was that was fun. Um, and uh, we um, had been married for thirty-two years uh, to the same person, um, yeah. and I'm slightly insane. <laughs> Pretty much me. <laughs> and I write and I write and publish my own line of um, of comic books that. Um, right. are various characters that I pretty much created or worked on with other people on so. So, um, without um, going into um, Armageddon, we'll leave that to later. Let's talk about comic books and why you got into comic books. I mean, you're a nerd, a comic book nerd, a geek. And so, did this sort of come across because you were able to set up um, Armageddon, or was it because you thought, this is what I want to do along with it? Well, I remember... I remember back, and I want to say it's 2001, but I could be wrong, but uh, let's say 2001, we hosted uh, Walt Simon, Walter and Louise Simonson at the show. And I remember off the cuff pitching him a comic idea that I had, not, not as a serious thing, just like this is the, an idea I had, I think this would be a great book. And him being very, very courteous and saying, yes, that's a good story, you should do something with it. And I mean, it could have been just being nice, probably was. Lovely yeah. man, lovely wife, very talented. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then it just sort of sat in the back of my head. And then I think about, I want to say 2007, um, uh, I was I was going to Comic Con, and um, mm. which I recommend to anybody. Comic Con is is the Mount Olympus of uh, Mount Everest, no Mount Olympus and Mount yeah. Everest of events. Yeah. Um, the uh, so I got. I get into LA and I've got some friends, um, Christian Gossett, who I've worked with quite a bit on these over the yeah. years. And yeah. I thought we were going to go to his house and the next morning we we're going to drive to Comic Con. And then instead he's like, no, we're, we're pretty much, we're going to pick up some stuff. And then we're just driving to San Diego. It's, it's only a three hour drive. So it's not horrendous. It's like a Rotorua trip from Auckland. But I'd literally just got off a 12 hour flight when I hadn't flown, flown a lot. And um, so I'm, I'm jet lagged and I'm tired and, and a norm. And, there's two ways I can go when I'm jet lagged and tired. I can either go the sleepy, grumpy way, or I can go the um, I won't stop talking kooky way. And I went that yeah. way. And um, the uh, 
so we're, we're having this we're having this trip and we're talking and I'm joking around and I I pitch him a version of this idea that I had uh, at Walton five six years ago and he was like that's great we should do that book we should do that book and yeah. um, and the problem I have is when people say shit like that to me I tend to be I'll, I'll actually remember it and so I followed him up and he just said you know let, yeah let's let's continue with that yeah. so we. Um, uh, yeah, um, we got together, we talked more, and then Christian came back down to New Zealand, must have been a year or so later, I don't think it was too long, a year or so later, and he was doing some film scouting, and we went up to Hokitika, and there's a there's an island off there that's just a sand, it's covered in sand dunes, and you used to be able to do, uh, if you got the right permissions, you used to be able to go across, and they would take in dune buggies, and spring blast. And on the way there, we we worked out, you know, the Beyond Reality Media name, the and okay. we pretty much laid out and worked on the story ideas for, um, I think, for Warden. And right. um, and that's when we just went from there. And then worked on getting an artist and and couldn't really find an artist. And then we made a good connection, and then that um, that followed. And that took years, just getting getting the setup for it in place. Like now, if I want to get an artist to do a book, I, I, I literally can contact a dozen people plus the, the half dozen guys I work with regularly, and I can get stuff done pretty quickly. If I need a piece of art, I can pay. I pay for it, but I can get it done. Um, right. Whereas back then, it was just it was a real struggle. And and like anything, it takes time to find those connections. Um, right. The biggest problem with with particularly I found with local artists is that this, they have day jobs. And normally when they're working on books and stuff, they want to work on their own stuff. So paying somebody right. to do something for them, it, might, it sounds nice, <laughs> but it's not a priority. And, and, and I understand that now. I didn't so much then. But um, so we, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we pretty much started then and, and just I had a couple other ideas of things we wanted to do and reached out to a couple other people. And, you know, before I know it, I've got, you know, 12, I mean, we pretty much started about 2010 was when we really got into this properly. So it took a few years to get to get it at that point where we were ready to go. And then you'd print a book and then we had to edit it because it wasn't quite right. And, you know, you'd, you'd think, oh, this is going to work. Or no, it's not. And, um, and you know, 15, uh, 13 years later, I've got about 15, 16 books. Um, I've got one that came out last year, which we haven't been able to release yet, which is the Time Travelling Tourist um, Organised Chaos, which Excellent. is... Uh, that one. And you got the new one. I think, yeah, the, I've got the, the old one. The new one. Yeah, that was the yeah. the time travel tourist is the most popular book we've done, and I'm really happy with that. Mm -hmm. And I, chaos was a uh, a direct sequel after half a dozen books in the middle of it, and um, right, and then um, volume four of Warden, which Excellent. is this is coming out uh, later this year. I'm just waiting for. It's so, supposed to be delivered in July, but uh, it was shipping nowadays. It, it could take longer. So, now you work with. Uh, you said you work with twelve different artists. You've got um, yourself, well, a bunch, uh, of, a bunch and, of bunch of different artists. Main about a core of three or four actually. But um, but there's yeah. always. But you've got you've got the the artist himself, and and normally there's an artist and a colorer. Um, with some books, it's an artist a. Um, inker and a colorer but i most of my artists do their own inking but there's a christian doklamensky who does great um inking for some of the books we've done um coloring i've got um two main guys that i've used for coloring uh kote carvajal and um Diego, uh, uh, juan uh, moraga um are the two main guys that i've used for that um, artists, I've got Gonzalo Martinez, Alan Robinson, who's just doing a Fantastic Four comic for Marvel at the moment. I'm very happy for him for that. Excellent. He did the cover for that in the first half half of this one. He couldn't do the second half, but we're, I literally just started on one issue into the final Warden volume, and he should be doing that depending on what his schedule ends up being like. So, um, so let's talk about uh, with uh, uh, Christian and yourself. Yeah, so let's talk about Christian and yourself building this uh, BRM, you know, uh, universe. Now, yeah. this these books you've got the inspiration, um, inspiration Duncan's Warden, traveling tourists, time traveling tourists, Darwin fairies, 
And what else we've got here? I think it's got. Is there another title in that that I'm missing? There's, okay, so the the way my titles work broke down, and I'll I'll, I'll do these separately. So there's there's Warden, and um, which we did with with Christian, and that's the mm -hmm. superhero. It was a superhero gothic sci-fi, essentially. Okay. And we're about over 400 pages into that uh, now. And again, wow. it, it's it was envisioned as maybe a 300 page book, and then I I got to the end of the that the original story and realized we could take it so much further and surprise it, it surprised me how how lovecraftian it's been inspired by um and yeah, christian it's, was it's, it's uh, it just, like i was when i was reading it, it, it it's very dark you know it's not yeah. your average you know um bat, no, uh, not it's not like that batman, way batman's a bit dark. Yeah. it's not like your uh, captain america or avengers book so tell us about the warden a bit more and then we'll, well move the on idea, to the next one. The idea of the warden was it was started off as this when the warden was the original idea I pitched to Walt Simonson. It was um, let's and I pitched this to Christian and he redeveloped it with it with me, right? So um, it the idea was very much Superman. Well, well, what if Lex Luthor was trapped in Superman's body? Okay. Uh, it's, it's the general, yeah. the, the basic idea of it, because the warden is very much a Superman archetype, and there's so many of them around. I mean, I'm just watching yeah. the boys at the moment, and Homelander is pretty much evil Superman. Um, so yeah. it's just, there's so many different versions of it. But this, the idea was, it is, that the warden is this um, goody two-shoes, uh, American dream, apple and, and uh, apple pie, superhero and he's always you know we've got the cheesy smile and the the you know you'll be okay little jimmy kind of attitude yeah but what he actually is is he's a prison and the bad guy is in inside him and what happens is whenever the warden is defeated the bad person who defeated him gets zapped and gets enclosed inside the warden and he becomes right. he's a prisoner and the the warden is a prison warden um, and he keeps them right. there. And the idea is that they'll be there sort of the fuel for the fire, but they also have to, uh, it's, it's to, uh, redeem them that they see, they can only see good. They can only see what the warden's doing. They can't interact. They can't do anything. It's, 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 it's hell, but it's, it's, that's the core idea that starts with it. And it's funny how, when you're writing a comic, how some of the side bits, don't seem important at all. Like Andy and Mandy and the first couple of issues are his kids, joke kids, no, and I honestly had no plans for them whatsoever. And yeah. at volume five, uh, volume, volume four, Andy's leading the the, the, the villains. He's he's the main yeah. character. I mean, and Mandy's turns up and she's a huge impact on it. Um, because yeah. characters, once you start once they start establishing themselves, once they start yeah. becoming real people, um, it's yeah. very easy to tell which direction they're going to go. And you yeah. might not agree with that direction. I wouldn't do some of the things that they go, obviously, but but the character says what the character's going to do. And I, I found with Warren, right. there's a lot of that that sort of came into place. And so we, um, Alan and Maynard Cote Carvajal, um, who's done the colouring. Um, Alan Robinson is doing the artwork. Did most of the artwork. I've had Mark Yaza do from um, Spain, do a little bit. Um, all great stuff. The latest, certainly Volume Four, is primarily written by me. Um, yeah. Christian's been involved, in, heavily involved in the early ones, and he was involved in the storyline. But he's um, and, but he's co-creator of that book. So that's the war. Yeah. Then there's um, Attica, which we've done. Attica was the book that sort of meandered a bit. I I wasn't happy with where the art ended up going um, in the first volume. We did this 180 page hardcover, which I, I love the hardcover, and I've got the. Uh, I don't know if you can see the there's the there's the poster. Uh, sorry, the cover artwork there. Um, awesome. And. Uh, uh, just the first volume, it, it goes somewhere, but I, and I had an idea of where it wanted to go. And it's very much a Greek gods, but in the modern world. Um, but the idea for this came from, and uh, I'm waiting for the trailer to drop next week, the Black Adam. And I just watched, I just watched a, a bit of a cartoon of him, 
um, on the Brave and the Bold, which is a surprisingly silly but good Batman cartoon. Right. And right. but the core, the, the story they had there was very much the story. And the the, story, the the comic story of Black Adam is you have you have Adam back five thousand years ago, and he the wizard says you have the powers of Shazam. He does he goes and does stuff. He turns evil. The wizard goes you are Black Adam, and he throws him in yeah. jail for five thousand years. And then yeah. in the current world, he comes out and he's pissed off and he's angry and he's ready to go things. And and I and my thought was. If you'd been in solitary confinement, so to speak, for 5,000 years, right. would you come out a better person or a worse person? And obviously, in Adam's case, he, he and now he's much more nuanced than that. But the core story was pretty much he comes out just as bad yeah. as he went in. There's no there's no changes. There's no adjustment. Boom. It's, um, I was watching um, Young Justice, and General Zod is in the Phantom Zone for 40 years. And he's the same yeah. dude. There's no, I've been in here 40 years and I've, I don't know, I've There's, maybe thought maybe I could have been wrong or I've done, no, he's Zod. He just comes yeah. out and does the same thing. And, and I can so, understand that, that analogy, but it, nobody goes into prison so, and mean, comes out the same way they were in, no matter who you are. So you, if, if, it's, if it's us, us normal human beings, we'd self-reflect, right? I mean, we'd go in with, think oh. about... What, what got me here? What attitudes brought me here? Do I think about my right, you know, moral things that I might have adjusted, yeah. done right or wrong? And so this is Attica for you, or is it this is Black Adam? No, that, that well, Attica is. There's all, every story you could point to, oh, this is where they got the idea. The idea of Attica is Black Adam. It's, it's nothing like Black Adam. It was purely the idea of, I'm going to put a powerful person in prison and see what happens. And when he comes out, he's going to be different instead of the same. And yeah. Attica comes out as a pacifist, as um, um, uh, the sort of the general way to describe it is, what if Superman was a pacifist, right? He comes out yeah. massively powerful. He's been essentially uh, storing up power for 5,000 years or two, whatever years, a couple of thousand years um, in this book. And he's, but he's also done horrific things that you can't yeah. necessarily forgive. And so in the first book, he's just trying to steer things, to help other people see that that their actions affect other people. Echoes of pain. Like if, if, mm -hmm. if I, um, well, okay. So uh, say if I go down the road and I punch somebody in the face and then I right. run away. You know, I have no consequence on my end. I'm just a dick. I've done something bad. But the person that I punched, he that's going to carry with him maybe forever. I mean, maybe that's something that, that just echoes in. And he might go home and beat his wife or he might right. shoot himself or he might just have a pissed off day and go and just be a dick to some other people. And, and it's, it's one action affects, 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 affects. Right. And the idea of Attica is very much that you need to stop that. You need to look at what's happening and go, if you do something, not, you don't, you don't have to, you can own up to it or you can try to fix it or whatever, but you have to acknowledge it so that it doesn't get worse. Right. Um, so the first book sort of has that and I just, but it just didn't come together quite the way I would have liked. And so I um, put it on the shelf for a bit and then I worked with Christian on the second book and the third one, we worked a little on it together, but primarily it's me. And um the uh, those ones are much more self-contained, and they're a bit more mythological. The the, the second uh, the second book is uh, Medusa's, and I loved how we got those put together. And essentially, Attica had um, screwed over the Medusa's, and this is him. They're still around, so this is him fixing it or trying to fix it because so you can never fix something like that. But you can at least try to make amends, and and that's up to the person to accept it or not. But at least it makes it it can make a difference. And the third one is very much um, uh, Zeus. What sort of genre do you think? What sort of genre do you think you put this into? Is this your mythology or supernatural genre? Because it's you've got Warden as superhero. Yeah, Gothic super, super, superhero is Warden. Attica is much more mythology um, and um, self-help. Quite frankly, I think there's there's the, I've written that book. There's a lot of personal stuff. Attica is my the most personal book I've written. There's a lot of yeah. Um, uh, a lot of personal stuff in there that, uh, and I've always used the books to a big degree to 
um, help my mental state. And Attica was the one that sort of worked on most on that. Um, yeah, it, it seems it seems more reflective in the sense that you know it's like what ifs, you know, because we we ask ourselves questions: What's the reaction if I do this? What's the reaction if I do that? And like you said, what what's the down downward spiral of things that we you know whatever chance things we you do. look at it, you look at it in the, the modern age and you've got you've got Jacinda Ardern saying be kind. Now some people beat her over the head with that and say like oh she's being yep. a little mean to this person she's not doing what she says. But the way yep. I interpret that message is if you're if you go out there and you do shitty things or you comp you know you're just COVID is overwhelming and it has been for everybody. And if you really, if you take yeah. that and you throw it out into the world, then all the people that you hit with that are going to have, they're going to bounce and they're going to bounce. And if you're throwing out at least yeah. some kindness or thinking about that, it makes a difference. And it's a very similar idea. I think that there's a misunderstanding of, well, the way I interpret what she means is pretty much just, right. just try not to make things worse for people around you. And you can do yeah. that just by just by being kind. And with with Pollux he, and, and and Attica, he's trying to be he's trying to redeem people, but he's also trying to show them that they need to stop or at least try to make amends for past sins, because those sins yeah. are still out there. They still exist. They might yeah. You if you say you you murder somebody and then you go on with your life. The, the family of that person and, and all of those things, they're living with that thing for the rest of their life. And that's never yeah. going to change. And if you go in and you go, okay, here's the answers you wanted. Here's the stuff that you needed. It yeah. won't fix it, but it can make a mm. difference. And then those people who were maybe angry or torn or not sleeping, maybe they get some sort of peace. And then that peace echoes on. And Attica is very much that, that in my mind. And, um, but yeah, uh, mythological self-help. And then, I, think, um, I mean, look, let's uh, like you know, you said, mentioned somebody about getting murdered. Like we've had a family member, a family member being murdered um, in Auckland, and so you know, for whoever did, you know, the person who did it went to jail. That's fine, mm -hmm. but now we still live with it, right? So the yeah. way I dealt with that pain was I created my own character, right? Like you're saying, you know, we create our own stories and stuff to get over whatever mm -hmm. we do personally. So. I, you know, I created my own character and went, okay, this is what I'll do with the story. You know, uh, two people done wrong, right? And then, and did you find when you're creating something with something you thought it was going to be small, or or did you come at it? I have this great idea. This is what it's going to be. Or did you come with it and go, this is a little idea, and then it expanded? Or how do you approach uh, your writing that. process? Very, very much that. There's little idea. I, I the characters you don't. I don't think until you're doing. One of the, the one of the things that I that surprised me the most and shouldn't have is that the characters tell you where you're going to take them. There, there's right. you know you can bring in bad people and you're still writing them from your own thing, but it's surprising how much you can you you you, you create the character and then one one decision leads to another, and by the time you sort of further down the road, you realize that the character is the one driving the, the direction that they're going in. Because you get to a point where you go, this thing has to happen. And then you go, well, if if this hurdle is there, this character is going to respond this way. And that's because the character has gone in that direction. I mean, you might start, it's like growing a child, you start them off, but they the, the, um, the personality is something that they almost feels like they create themselves. So um, right. you're very much small, like an acorn that just grew. And all that. And Attica is very much awesome. that. I mean, I had a much better idea of the story, but um, I'm happy. I've been happy with the second vol, second and third volume than I was with the first of that. And I've got a fourth volume filed away that's a couple of years away that was more of yeah. a homage to the, um, uh, what's it called? The, um, the Prince and the Sparrow um, story. Um, what's that about? But, I mean, I'm not. I'm not aware uh, of that. Um, well, there's, 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 when I was a kid, when I was a kid, they used to. We used to listen to the radio on Sunday mornings, and they did an amazing Spike Milligan, "Bad Jelly the Witch." It was one of my favorites. I'd listen to. Right. I still listen to that now. It's such a great one, right? Yeah. But there was another one which was, I think, read by Orson Welles. I could be totally wrong there, and it was written by I want to say Oscar Wilde, which again I could be totally yeah. wrong. This is off the top of my head, and essentially, it's a story of. Um, 
uh, a statue covered in gold and jewellery. And the statue looks across the city and he sees um, uh, ch starving children. And the sparrow's on his right. shoulder. And the statue says to the sparrow, because the statue can talk in the story. Um, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Over there. Um, <laughs> here's the sparrow. Um, take off my, my gold um, things and, and give them to the poor so that they may be fed. And then the right. sparrow comes back. Remember right now. Yeah. yeah. Right. And in the end, he um, the sparrow takes pretty much every, the, the the statue takes everything off, and he plucks out his eyes, and he can't see. And the yeah. and the sparrow dies because it misses winter, but it doesn't want to leave the prince. And the um, the end of the story is a little religious, but it's you know the town's guys. The mayor looks up and goes, "Oh, that statue looks pretty shitty. Let's throw that away." And um, yeah. a when they throw it away, the angel Gabriel comes down and the Lord has said, bring me the two most precious things. And he brings them the broken heart of the statue and the little bird, something like that. Anyway, but that, that story, um, I, I had an idea for that, that I wanted to uh, do differently in uh, uh, for Attica, but that, that's, that's a couple of years away and I, I, it's very raw, but that, that's where that's going. It's, it's, so then, it's a pretty, did, it's, um, the, the actual story. I remember reading it and, uh, hmm. and I, it's a very important story that, like, um, in the sense of what it's about, it's about giving. And, uh, you know, for, for what I can think of it, it's like you see something, a need, right, and you're trying to fill it. And even if you're trying to fill it, you yourself become empty uh, because you've given out so much of it. And that yeah. kind of reminds me of, what you know, like, in a sense, what you've done with uh, Armageddon. Because you've come out, like, you know, we're talking about 27-odd years ago, right? And you saw... Um, you know, you, you're doing what you're doing with Doctor Who, and I'm sorry to bounce off here, but this is, you know, I think this is a cool way to go into this, is that you, um, that you, you know, you guys were putting together something involved in what in the new culture, the geek culture, and there was a need, and that need grew and grew to what it is now. And well, it wouldn't I mean, have gotten to that if you didn't decide to walk into that or take well, that on I mean, board. If you, if you switch to switch to Armageddon talk for a bit. The um... I don't know when when we started though, um, Armageddon or geek culture was not it was I mean it was a thing, and there was certainly a yeah. lot of it out there, but it wasn't what it is today. It wasn't accepted like it is today. I mean, when I was a kid, it was it was almost um, I don't know a, a, a mental deformity that you wanted to hide from people. It was yeah. you know because you didn't you just you. You didn't. I mean, you were, oh, you're a nerd. Okay, well, you get beaten up at school. Yeah. You're going to get, you know, um, embarrassed and, and yeah. made fun of. And that, that was pretty much yeah. the way. I mean, a lot of people went to see Star Wars. A lot of people got toys and stuff. But there's still, there was a very big disconnect. And it's only been, in my mind, in the last 10 to 15 years, so since the yeah. mid 2000s, that it's really become okay. a thing where people were like, oh, yeah, this is okay. You can do this now, right? Well, that's, that's how yeah. it felt to me. And um, so when we started, it was very much um, just a thing for small things. And there's a bunch of small little events. I went to the, the geek market in um, Christchurch last weekend. Um, and yep. there's a bunch of these little events, which are very similar to what we sort of were doing with the Doctor Who Club for a while. Um, yeah. But like anything, there was just there was just a point where I think I, I think I just wanted to do something bigger. And so we did. And... Um, yeah. The the difference is that um, we we just continued with it, and certainly the first five or so years, it was not a big thing at all. I mean, it was big for us, but it wasn't um, wasn't even a fraction of what it is now. And right. then we just just stayed the course yeah. and kept going with it, really. And and um, of course, I mean, New Zealand being New Zealand, we've had to diversify, and there, there's. Uh, one of the explanations I've always had for what I like about Armageddon the most is um, I, I'm a huge Doctor Who fan. I mean, I, if I'm one thing, that's what I am, right? I've been a Doctor Who nerd okay. since forever. We went to England for the 50th anniversary thing. I met and hosted yeah. a bunch of the Doctors. Um, if I can do a Doctor Who thing, I, I freaking will. Um, yeah. Now, the problem that I have is if you do a Doctor Who convention, or an anime convention, or a cosplay yep. convention, or a, anything that's specific, right? Um, you're right. feeding that you're feeding that culture, which is great, right? 
And as a Doctor Who fan, I'll go to a Doctor Who convention any day of the week if I can, right? Um, but it doesn't necessarily grow that fandom. It feeds it. But unless you're right. a fan of something, you're not going to go, oh, there's this cosplay event on. I'm into cosplay. I'll go. But if you're not into cosplay, you're probably just going to go, mm, maybe not. Now, some people will, and that's great. Right. But um, the problem with any any kind of thing is that if it's specific, you generally, unless you're interested in it to start with, you're not going to go. If you don't have no, I have, look, I, I want to know who the All Blacks beat, but I don't want to go to any of the games. I'm not into <laughs> racing, anything like that at all, right? Yeah. But, um, and that's, so it's the same sort of thing. If you're not into rugby, you're not going to go to a rugby game unless somebody drags exactly. it. And then you, maybe you get into it and you become a big, passionate fan. But realistically, you're just not. Um, and fandom is very much the same as that. So with Armageddon, we've been able to uh, grow it so that, I mean, Armageddon doesn't mean a damn thing. It's just a cool name that we came up with because we didn't want to describe right. one thing. We wanted to cover a bunch of things. Um, right. And that's always been the strength, that the show, every show we do can have a bit of everything involved. And it's much more diverse than most shows internationally are. Um, but also that's that's purely because of the nature of New Zealand. There's, there's just there's, there's a handful of pop culture stores in this country. The, the fact that we pull off a giant show in Auckland is just is goddamn amazing considering uh, realistically what we have to work with um, locally. Um, but, so, but there's a lot of passionate people and there's a lot of people who are into different types of fandoms and, and we've been able to sort of keep going to a point where we've ridden the wave where we now we've got people who were children that went to us before that had their own kids. Right. So stopping for a minute there. Now you mentioned it was in mid 2010 that you saw the rise of popular, uh, you know, uh, no, 20, fandom uh, 2005, popular. I would, I would say if I had to pick a rough time, 2005 ish. Um, certainly for Is us, that, like when we moved to the showgrounds in 2009, that was the start of when things really picked up for us. And it wasn't until well, I'm thinking, about... I'm thinking that's that's probably around when um, Iron Man was coming out. That whole, uh, you know... 2008. 2008. 2008. We'll 2008. That. But yeah, Marvel, over the last 10, 10 or so years, Marvel has definitely yeah. been one of the, the defining factors for, um, for people to be just more accepting of it. Again, yeah. people are still a little thing, but... There's there's always different levels there, but um, back when I was a kid, it's I got beaten up at least a couple of times. You know, mm. I had stuff, <laughs> I had some encounters that I'd rather not talk about. That that be, purely because yeah. I was a, I was a nerd at the time. Um, yeah, and I'm sure, I hope that doesn't happen now, but I'm wait, wait. almost sure it does. But um, yeah, both of us, uh, both of us are in the similar age group. I'm 49, and you just turned 40, uh, 50 last year. So yeah. I saw that around me as well. I was one of the ones who used to get picked on as well. And so, you know, I, it was like the nerds would, like, get away from everybody and be in the library and have their own little yeah. club and play the game, you know, whatever. And it's, it's kind of like... Stranger um, Things, and they're sort of... it's, it's very, I can feel the, the yeah. 80s vibe in there quite nicely. Yeah, and they've really pulled it off to make people realise what it was like back then compared to yeah. what is now. Now you can just buy a T-shirt off the freaking you know, off the warehouse, which, you know, or, or whatever store's got them. JJ's got your, uh, you know, your anime, uh, uh, what is it called, um, Dito Hero or something, uh, the yeah. horror, you know, yeah. anime. Well, I, I, again, the, the world has opened up a lot. It's a lot easier to get. I mean, I used to, um, when I was around 20 or so, we would, um, we would go to these video days and um, at a community, um, normally a church or a community hall in Auckland somewhere. And there, every three months, there would be uh, they would screen um, the current Star Trek. And um, okay. must have been yeah yeah. And they would somebody would somebody would get the videotapes from America, send them over, and have an NTSC player. And we'd turn up and we'd watch them because they never screened them properly on TV, you know, New Zealand TV, or we got them a year later. And I did a lot of that yeah. with Doctor Who as well because you used to there wasn't the videotapes went out so you if somebody had copies you were like oh my god I can watch this stuff whereas now you can watch you know if you want to watch something you can find it and you can watch it I I, I wanted to right. I saw um I was watching uh, Chronicles of Riddick which is one of my favorite films I mean Vin Diesel's an idiot yeah. but 
he's great in this film. And yeah, um, he's awesome and gritty. Yeah, and I was yeah. reading about um, a thirty-minute animated version that they did that I'd never heard of, oh. and I was like, okay. And I it's found really it, cool. downloaded it, and watched yeah. it within space of a couple of a couple of hours. And you know, but back in the back in the day, not something you could do. So the shows yeah. became something where people can go, would gather, and uh, I think yeah. they've, they've evolved much. The, like a comic book where the character takes his own life, Armageddon's gone in so many different directions that, that I can't, that I couldn't, wouldn't control even if I could, and I'm glad I don't. And people have invested their own passion into it, their own thoughts, their own memories, um, and they use the show as a gathering ground to meet other people, to, you know, to a lot of it's, a lot of people are living online. This is the real world they can come to, and it's still not the real world. Um, yeah. We're very, it, it's it's become a very different event over the years, and in ten years' time, it'll be a different event again because, you know, the last couple of years we've changed a lot of stuff we're doing, and and we're we're adapting again and moving forward again. So, it's I, I love I mean like you know talking about like being able to meet up with different people there. You've always the the fact that you've been able to get to where you are. You've been able to bring some amazing, like for me as a comic book fan, right? Mm. Huge names that I can I consider huge names in my, in, you know, in my um, fandom. Um, and so, how has it been trying to over the years trying to get these people to come and you know because I know most of them like, you know, they they're committed, they're year round committed to whatever they're doing overseas because I mean we're New Zealand, right? So we're yeah. at the bottom of the world. We're probably the last consideration for them to tour because no, it's twelve hours. No, trip. By, by no means. A lot of them, a lot of creators and any guests, really. A lot of them historically um, were always very yeah. keen to come to New Zealand. That's we we. Okay. I mean, certainly Lord of the Rings didn't hurt, but um, yeah, the yeah. Uh, they do a lot of shows around the around America, and that's where they make their money. And there, there's you know, it yeah. is a business, very much so. And yeah. one of the problems we've always had is that, that we're not. Is financially returning as um, some of the bigger shows or, or whatnot in America, mm. but um, we yeah we're normally uh, some some people are there just like I'm too busy I can't make it and you just go that's fine totally get it and others are like I want to go and they'll they'll contact us and I've got enough I've been doing this a long time so I've got a pretty good reputation internationally um, yeah so historically one of the things that's helped us is. We'll reach out to to one guest and we'll just say, oh, yeah, by the way, we hosted this person, this person, this person that you might know. Feel free to ask them. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and that, that's always good because then they can, you know, they can go, oh, I'm traveling halfway around the world. I don't know who these guys are. And Mark uh, uh, Mark Wade says, oh, yeah, I've been there three times. They looked after me. Or uh, New Zealand's yeah. the show's crap, don't go. You know, there, there's everybody's, you know, different. And then there's some guests that one or two guests that we've had that didn't have a good time. Generally, they have. We, we, we've certainly, we, we've gotten to a point where we look after people pretty well. The other thing is, like, I've noticed that, like, where the um, comic stands over time has gone down, but the yeah. anime side has gone up, the expectations yeah. on. So how do you grab your anime guests? How do you get those people? Because, I mean, like, you're, a, you know, you're on the side of uh, you're Doctor Who, Western media, yeah. you know. You're, that's, you're, my, that's my you're, fandom. You're, yeah. That's my fandom, right. but there's a lot of people who are. Um, it, it's like I have agents that I deal with, and with voice acting, that's become more and more of a thing. I mean, when we first hosted some Dragon Ball Z guys in 2001, I got them through going to Comic Con in 2000, and they were really okay. keen. And, and back then, it wasn't yeah. something that was a big thing, and it's certainly yeah. over the last 20 years, it's become bigger. And and I've noticed in the last two years of COVID um, yeah. that voice actors have become a lot more popular in, in, in other seas events, um, which is why, like, next weekend's show, is, our focus is voice acting because we, we put a hunk of money into a big esports event we're running and, and we wanted to make it different. But also when we planned the show, I didn't know if we could actually physically host people. Um, yeah. So the voice acting option was the safer bet in terms of, you know, if, if they couldn't make it, we could make it work. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, there's always changes. There's always 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 changes to how we do it, and and 
um, what's popular one year and, and the shows that are popular and the voice actors and the actors and who's available and who's filming locally, which we don't seem to get much of a benefit from that, but there, there's always the odd one. Um, you know, there, there's always things that we can do. Now, you mentioned finances and, the, you know, with what people what people think of what uh, Armageddon's making and what is the actual reality of it because I'm like, mm -hmm. like – you know, there's a lot of costs involved in, like, say, if you're bringing, you know, a voice actor from Japan or, you know, who's well anyway. known in that community, but you're thinking, well, how do I weigh up with another one who's known in America? How do you, you know, like you say, you deal with agents and stuff. The cost of bringing these people over, how do you actually go, well, do they go, well, this is what this is my thing is, and then you go, well, what if, do you negotiate or how does it work? Yeah, I mean, look, we... There are some guests that we host that um, we go, okay, this person's going to cost X, Y, and Z. Uh, they're worth every dollar. We should we should spend that money and get them to the show. Um, and there's others that cost, you know, sometimes we'll just go, look, we can't afford to spend that. And other times we'll just spend the money because what the hell. Uh, it's, it's the big difference. I think I, I think that the ment some people's mentality is that we're this big corporate thing and it's, it's money, 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 money. And, 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 Certainly money drives what we do because I need to be able to afford to live and be here next year, right? Yeah. Um, but a lot of the stuff we've done over the years, if we were a, a proper event, uh, yeah. there'd be no way. There'd be just no way. I mean, there, 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 there's so many things that we fund um, separately from um, the show that if we were um, if we were purely looking at the numbers, we wouldn't do. And that's that's because I'm a nerd, and and yeah, some things I do 100 percent because it's a money venture, and and, and that's because I'm a businessman. Yeah, but right. More and more. So let's um, have a, um, talk about that. Let's move on to about the what what actually how much you know each city that you do it and benefits enormously by what you put on we, by the way you put a, on these events. We we did a. Um, uh, I don't know what to call it. We we did a, uh, a we had a we had hired a company that can track yeah. what your economic footprint is, and right. for the Auckland show, the economic footprint was fourteen million dollars. Okay, yeah, that was the you know, and we took that to the council and said, you know, here we go. We're doing um, when we do a show, we generate fourteen million dollars worth of revenue for the city. Right. So, and that was. Few years back, it's probably more now. So, what was it? So what was the reaction? Show, like, at least a couple million per show. I mean, I don't see that. Yeah, I'm so just saying what, that's people traveling, spending money, paying for food, yeah. buying stuff at the show, hotels, accommodation, tourism, all of that kind of stuff. So, I mean, every, every event, no matter what the event is, it's the food show, it's Armageddon, it's the home show, whatever, every event has a solid financial footprint that it leaves behind. Um, right. That is significantly higher than what the event itself generates. Um, it's it's all the yeah. it's it's collateral damage in of of a financial aspect that really that helps the environment. And I know um, for Auckland next weekend, there's a lot of companies that have been waiting for the show because it's their major fun. I mean, they, they were hoping for yeah. it last year because the, you know this makes them a lot of money and. They've been on a starvation diet, and they're really hungry, waiting to get to get well, some I mean, it's, it's, into the home. Everybody's been on a starvation diet for the last two years, and I, yeah. and I think the small businesses, especially small businesses, but now with you guys running, how many shows do you guys do now? So this, well, okay. So at the moment, um, we are, um, we are doing technically six shows this year. We've got. Um, uh, outside of Auckland, we have Tauranga in July, Palm, which is supposed to be in February, uh, Palmerston in August, and then uh, Wellington and Christchurch in December, which was supposed to be in April, March, April of this year. Um, so normally they're a bit more spread out, but we had to combine them in. Um, we've got the Auckland show in June, and yep. uh, which is number five or number one for the year, I should say. And then ideally yeah. we're doing our main Auckland one, which will be more celebrity focused. We've got a bunch of actors and animation people and whatnot planned in for that. And that's set for October, but 
honestly, it depends on if the venue is even available because, honestly, we have no idea at the moment. The, the showgrounds Who's went into liquidation. Me? The showgrounds went into liquidation oh, a year ago. And, oh, wow. um, sorry? Oh, so if, if the showground went into liquidation, were there an option where you guys could actually go to the council and say, hey, could you make that, you know, kind of like no. a thing so we could actually take uh, a piece a whole, of it? Or? The whole events industry has got, is on tender hooks at the moment, and including us, and we've been looking at options. And um, at the moment, um, there's we're waiting uh, for what's going to happen. I honestly don't know. It's It's... it's Highly likely that next weekend's June event is the last one we'll do at the showgrounds. Um, I'm hoping not, um, but it's also possible that we'll be doing October there and we'll be fine. But it's possible we won't do October at all this year. It just won't happen. I've looked at other venues and nothing's available that will do the job. And we, we're a huge event and trying to squeeze us into a smaller venue just doesn't work, unfortunately. So um, I am looking at some My options for next year. My first event I went to was uh, 2007 Atea. Yeah. And, you know, the second, it, the last, second was, the last year show we did. Yeah. For that one, that was the first time I actually went to a convention, cosplay, um, I mean, not cosplay, sorry, a comic convention, that sort of pop culture convention in my life. You know, I'm like, I think when I was like, what? Gosh, must have been like about 30 something odd years old. And I, it was a, my first experience. Mm. And, I don't know what I was doing. I'd never been to one. So, and I think that a lot of people have the same, same thing when they go to Armageddon for the first time. They don't even, they don't understand what it is. But now when, you, when you've gone to it several times, like I have, I know where the, um, where the photo, photos for my, uh, you know, for my favorite stars are going to be. I know where the uh, auditorium to uh, talk to um, Chekhov, you know. I, I, I mean, I've had such amazing experiences at Armageddon. Yeah. I mean, like, I got a photo with, um, and I always forget her name, um, the star of um, Sanctuary, you know, and uh, that she oh, made me feel. Amanda. That's it. It's always a hard name to remember, Amanda Tepping, you uh, know, Amanda, and Amanda she made me feel it. like, yeah, she made yeah. me feel great, great, you know, she put a smile on me. I got to, um, you know, ask a question of Chekhov about Babylon 5, you know, and that sort of experiences and then i got david lloyd to sign you know draw something for me and sign um sign my v for vendetta mask these experiences that live with us because we're such fans of what we you know enjoy and um and i think what armageddon does which you know i mean is bring all that together and make us feel good about who we are as a you know community well, a but then, like, that's, about, also, like, that's also people investing their own taking what we do and making it their yeah. own and going, we're going to meet up with friends. We're going to do this. We're going to spend a bit of money or I'm going to support some, um, some artist alleys or whatever. I mean, they, they, it's where we can go. We can, we can present the show, but what people do with it and how they interpret it and how they, what they take away from it so much on their other end. And it's amazing that way. And I love it. I love that mm. because it, it really does come down to, providing something more and i i, I think that um that i mean we're not over covid i mean i i don't know what i don't know where we are right now we're in this i feel like we're in this limbo ground of um covid's done but it's not but this is the red this is what it's going to yeah. be like for the next 10 years because you know unless there's a cure tomorrow this is it this is the world we're living yeah. in um but i do think that the event will be um, will be something that people have been looking forward to because there's so Auckland. It's nearly been two years since we've done an Auckland show. And there's so many people that are looking to get hold, talk to other people, and meet with them, see them, dress with them, catch up, and that that's a yeah. whole that's a social um, aspect that I sort of I I appreciate and I I like it, but I'm not. I'm personally I'm not much of a um, I always feel a bit more solitary in a crowd. If, if, if you can, yeah. you know, it, make, it makes it I hard to know. Really. I think people see it a different yeah. way, and I, I'm very good at doing the people thing and whatnot. But I'm, yeah. I'm, um, I, I tend to uh, tend to have some 
reservation, mental reservations. Because, you know, I just, I, I have a hard time um, doing that. And as I'm getting older, I'm, I'm finding that that's something that's more and more who I am. And, yeah. uh, and and there's a lot of other people that are like that. And I don't think they, I think they just assume mm. that I'm this big outgoing guy. And, and to a big degree, I, I am. But it's, but yeah. I'm also quite happy just sitting in a corner doing nothing. So. Right. I, 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 um, I understand that in the sense that a lot of cosplayers have told me that as well, you know, they, they're they like very insular, they're very quiet, and then when they put on the costume, boom, yeah. you know, blow it up and, you know, they're happy, shaking hands, taking photos and everything, you know, and that's another aspect of um, conventions where you've got like cosplayers being having events like that. When did you decide that was going to be a part of Armageddon? Cosplay, yeah, the whole competition. Uh, 2003, we were doing, okay. um, uh, we hosted some Japanese creators, um, from Japan, as Japanese creators generally are, um, who yeah. were some of the artists and designers of Sailor Moon. And, um, I can't honestly can't remember the origins of the cosplay thing. I, I, I think it was yeah. something that we, we'd I'd seen a little internationally, but it wasn't anything that I'd seen properly in New Zealand, and that was so. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's like, oh, Sailor Moon. I, I love Sailor Moon. As, as a cartoon, I mean, it's I both stupid it. and great in equal measure in my mind. Yeah. Um, but the yeah. uh, cosplay was just the thing. It started from there. And it certainly built up. And there, there's people who worked on it that were um, significantly invested in, in making it a thing. And, and we owe them a lot to, to get to that point. And including the current hosts that I personally... Yeah. I tend to leave them to their thing because they know what they're doing and they don't want me sticking my nose in either way. I mean, it's big enough that I, I don't want to stick it in places. Um, but they do a great job. But that's a community and it's become a community. And it, it's, it's um, and you're right, it is about, well, I mean, there, there's many different ways you could read how the cosplay community is. Some of it is about just putting on a facade and going out and, and being social and energized when that is not who you are and yeah. and there's others that that's 100 percent who they are um yeah. you know but that's, that's a joy. you get to be what you want to be yeah let's um like there there is the aspect of cosplay where you know a lot of people tend to think that like just because someone's in a costume that they are that person whereas that they actually like that's we're saying that they can't they yeah. Quiet, well, you know, they just players not consent. We've got guards around. I mean, if somebody has a problem, yeah. it always irritates me a bit when I hear somebody complaining about, oh, I had a problem there, but they didn't say anything or do anything. It, it'd be worse. Yeah. I mean, it'd be worse if they did say and nothing was done because Definitely. I'd like to think that if there's a problem, we address it as quickly as we can. Um, yeah. And there, unfortunately, there are always some people that are just people who should not be in a crowd. Um, and they... Yeah. Um, but that's the joy of um, being in a group. And most cosplayers yeah. generally are in groups of people. So that if, if there's the odd issue, which no matter what event you do, there's going to be the odd creeper, for want of a yeah. better word. Um, and, they, then, and, and the weird thing is, weird thing is that they actually seek, seek out these things. You know, that's their thing. It's like you always have someone who's out there to cause problems. Yeah, but they could go to a, they'll go to a rugby game and be the same for some people there. It, it, it's just different yeah. because you think you can walk up and take it. I'll just take it. So I was at, I was at Comic-Con in, I don't know, 10, 10 something years ago, uh, during when Fastcat yeah. was on. And I was yeah. in line to get an autograph from Gigi Edgley, who played Chiana in, in it, right? Uh, and that's the blonde chick, isn't it? Uh, no, like white, 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 gray. I love yeah, Farscape. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If anybody's watching hasn't seen Farscape, freaking watch it. I, it's I amazing. love it. Yeah, it's so well done. Yeah. It takes about six or seven episodes to really get going, but once it gets moving, it just goes. And, and it's yeah, four, it's awesome. four seasons and a mini series that finishes the story amazingly and wraps it up. Uh, one of my favorite shows. Um, yeah. Anyway, so she's she, I'm in line and I know a guy, a couple of guys in front of me, so I'm close enough that I can hear what they're saying. And he goes, yeah. "Oh, can I get a photo?" And so she she goes, "Sure." So she stands up, and the guy yeah. um, stands next to her, and he puts his hand right on her ass, and you just I just watched her just lift his hand up, 
right? Didn't yep. say anything, took the yep. picture and off he went, right? And then she just sort of commented that he was a little handsy to the guy. And I was just, little, I watched this and went, Jesus, wept. But the way yep. she responded to it was like it was a something that had happened more than once, which unfortunately I think yeah. it had. Um, yeah, and I think it's, it, it, like, that's you the get, thing. I you get guys like the guys, maybe some girls and others, yeah. um, that's how they are. But that that's not, they're, they're, you're talking outliers. And ideally, if that's anything it. like that happens, we encourage anybody to say something. I mean, we're pretty general. And I'm happy to boot somebody out if they're inappropriate at an event. But we don't tend to get a lot of people reporting that. Um, yeah. It's always afterwards we hear, oh, this person was a little skeevy. But there's also the other side of that is being skeevy isn't some isn't a reason to kick somebody out because there's people who just don't come across personable. Yeah. That's a, and that's the thing about the nerds as well. There's a there's a outliers of nerds who are like kind of the autistic spectrum, right? Because they're not their social skills aren't there with that. And uh, I find that we, we um, to sort of be careful with that because we we do attract with the audience we get we get a lot of different people and there's a lot of people who well not a lot but there's some people who you're right just don't function well in groups and you yeah. do have to factor that in and sometimes you just have to say look just take a step back a bit but some people don't get it it doesn't necessarily forgive bad behavior um, because you still yeah. have to function in society but it can mitigate it. Right. Let's move on to like celebrity guests and how do you get um get across to getting like someone like Tom Ellis who would love who I love would have loved to meet because Lucifer is one of my my mm. number one shows in the last couple of years and you know when they gutted it I was you know when they were going to close it I was gutted and I was all over Twitter going get him on Netflix get him on Netflix because mm. I love that series so much and then to have both of them come to New Zealand and at a time when did they come was it like twenty twenty when COVID uh, was on? No, no, it was before then. But um, I remember when Lauren arrived. I missed her at the airport because she dyed her hair pink, and it took me a minute to recognize her. Um, she was lovely, absolutely crazy, absolutely crazy in a delightful way, but totally the opposite yeah. of um, the character she plays. Um, look, I, every, every, sometimes I, I've got a lot of a um, lot of agents that I deal with, and they send me names and say, "Oh, would you be interested in this person?" Or they send me a list, and I'll pick out names. Um, like um, uh, Tom Ellis, I've, tr I've talked to two different agents about him. I've gotten to a point where we at least had a modest conversation, but there's so some people just they're so busy, or the money needs to be higher, or that they're they're just not interested in a long trip, or they don't want to do conventions as much, or there's so many different reasons for them not to do a, an appearance. And just because we want it doesn't make it stop, right? And there's others yeah. that... Um, then, I mean, you always, like, wish... Are there, like, some ones that you, like, on your top of the list that you've been trying to get for years and you haven't been able to get? Yeah. And then sometimes you get them. I was trying to get uh, uh, John Barrowman for, like, a decade. And then, yeah. then we just got him, you know? And it was like, great, let's do that. You know? Right. Torchwood. Um, you know? Yeah. Torchwood, and, 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 Doctor Who. Like, I loved him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we got John I, I, and I, Tom, um, I, Tom Felton at the same show, and it was because they all said yes, and I was like, if I turn them down now, I'm just not going to get them. Yeah. So we, we just went for it. And, and Nathan, we got him in that sweet spot between Castle and The Rookie where he was just off for a year, and all he was doing was some guest starring, and he was taking a break. So he came yeah. down, did the show, went down to Queenstown and, and had, had a fun time there. And we're trying to get him now would be – as you know, the American shows can get these guys because they literally can just fly in on the Saturday morning, do a day, do two yeah. days, and fly back, and they're filming the next day. It's not a problem. We don't have that. It's a week to get here, you know, to come here, do the show, and go back. You, it's a week of their time. And that's not – that only works if they do it a holiday or if they can really plan it. Because the worst thing is to have somebody do all the work, buy all the tickets, get everything sorted, and then the week before the show they cancel because they're – Filming schedule changed. I mean, we've had that happen, and it's, it's, but it's better to mitigate that if you can help it. That's something that a lot of the like the attendees don't understand how that system works because, like, you know, you, they're on like schedules where that's like uh, they they might be on a film set that's costing like five hundred thousand dollars a day to be on well, because most, of filming. Most talented, and, we're booking, yeah, most talented we're booking them, they're not actively filming. 
because uh, unless it's something that happens like a week before a show, which is very rare, um, where you know their schedule is free, I tend to avoid that. I just you just can't trust it, and most actors won't commit to that anyway because it, it's too tiring. Um, yeah, it normally is just a matter of who's filming and who's not, and and, and even then though they'll stop for work. And that can still happen at any point. And with the um, in the in the in the good old days, um, so to speak, you the filming schedule would start about June, July, and finish about um, February. So you knew that you had that sort of window of doing events. But now with streaming, they're filming year round. There's no specific yeah. time, so everybody's all over the place. But fortunately, there also is a lot more people to choose from. I mean. Um, Classically, historically, it's mainly white males, uh, the audience, but, uh, not the audience, but as the, the actors you can get. Um, because yeah. most TV shows had one female person, one person of color, and if you had anybody beyond uh, a cisgendered person in there, it was very rare of anything pre 2010. Um, right. Yeah. Um, whereas now, you, you, I mean, like Star Trek. Um, uh, Strange New Worlds, and even in Discovery, yeah. which I love Discovery, it's a little bit of hate, but I think those are just haters. Um, heavy female um, crew, um, which is right. great, and, and just but also for, as a person who runs events, it's nice to have. Uh, um, every time a new show comes out, there's an, it means you have more people that you can host, and it makes it right to a degree a bit easier to get people down because um, because there's more of them. But it still comes down to who's That's filming true. and when, you know. I mean, yeah, I was and also if they're available or not. You... Sorry. And of course, like you said, like if they're available or not. So moving yeah. on, about um, do you get like do you take on board requests? So like I say, um, I want Frank Miller to come just for the comic side of things, so I can go and get all my comics, all my Batman stuff signed, just because I'm so much into that whole Batman scene. And I'll, you know, and his, uh, and his uh, Electra and Daredevil, so I can get all my books on. Is there a possibility we go? Okay, uh, let's hit up Frank Miller because I'm one person, but there might be a thousand behind me who are also wanting the same thing that you're not, you you're uh, not aware of. Honestly, Would you honestly, take on that request? No, um, I, I no. don't. It's because we get it's it's actually the one of the work things that irritates me the most is we get people tagging people saying oh you should come to the show and there's so much more to it than that um, and 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 to to be thrown in under the bus and then we have to either have a conversation and then normally and then money gets involved and it it's not just a matter of going oh you should jump on a plane and come down it's it's okay what's the flights what's the hotel how much per diem yeah. what's my fee. Um, da, 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 yeah. And how am I available when they want me? There's so much to it. And when somebody just connects you, or normally it's Twitter, it's always Twitter, um, and just says, oh, this person would be really interested, no person is <laughs> going to say, oh, I wouldn't love to come to New Zealand. I, uh, the amount of times I've had, oh, I've been at a show and I talked to um, William Shatner and he'd love to do New Zealand. I'm like, I'm sure he would. What else is he going to say? Oh, I don't want to go to that shithole. You know, of course he's going to say, yes, New Zealand would be lovely. I've been there before. It's a great place. Doesn't Yeah, and then you, then you, got, then you got to have the conversation with William oh, and he'll go, beyond I'm that. sorry, mate, yeah. can't do it because, you know, because I'm way busy, you know, and so mm -hmm. on. And there is uh, that, you know, and, I, and I'm one of the guys, who, you know, I'm like, it would be nice and it would be cool. But then again, you've already got things lined up and in place already. To, to come to and Normally so for the, like, what is I know the, who's coming for this entire year i know who's coming that's it that's There's what no, i'm going to ask next is who is coming this entire year at for armageddon no, so i can get my little notebook know, out and put the names in. yeah i don't even know i'm doing a show in october at the moment so um i've got a lineup <laughs> you know yeah. but also it can change i can say oh we right. got Doctor who guests coming and then it just doesn't happen so i we more and more we're announcing stuff closer but also the guest aspect is a, is for some people and obviously for yourself it's a huge part and it, it's certainly from my end it's a fun part but more and more we're discovering that there's, there's aspects we can put into the show that will enhance the event itself goes beyond the celebrity aspect and there's there's some uh, there, there's a lot of stuff we put into next weekend show that we wouldn't be doing if we were spending three hundred thousand dollars on bringing guests to the show. 
Um, right. So let's talk know, about so, uh, next weekend show. Yeah. What's who's coming? Wh you know what's happening compared to because this is your first event in Auckland. That's a second event, right? So this is June event, and then you got the October event. So let's discuss about the. You know why oh, did you decide that? Yeah, we're doing October if we have a venue. At the moment, quite frankly, we don't. So I right. wouldn't. If you're on the fence about going, you should go because it might be the last one. Yeah. I'm hoping not, but I honestly I couldn't tell you which what where October is going. I'm, I'm hoping to know in the next couple of weeks. Um, okay. Look, we've we've got. Uh, I mean, the show's full. Um, we've got esports and gaming has always been a big part of the event, and we're doing uh, spending a crap ton of money on a massive esports stage. Um, which we've never done before. We got a hundred computers and, and twenty Xbox Series S consoles, and um, and then we've got all the gaming setup that we we've grown over the last couple of years, um, plus a bunch of extra things that we're working on, plus more design and more interactivity and more visuals than we've ever had. I, I'm I'm yeah. genuinely excited how the show is going to look. I mean, uh, I think that people who um, have been to any of our shows are going to go away really loving this one. Um, we decided that we wanted to do more animation. Um, so while okay. we've still got some virtual guests coming in, which has been a great addition, it's a great way to actually have people, like we get Carlo Esposito, and I'm just, just watching him on The Boys. And um, he's in New York. So there's no way he's coming to the show that weekend. But we can beam him in yeah. and you can talk to him live and have an interact, which is amazing. And it's opened up so many options for us for guests that would be hundred grand to bring to the show, but we can beam them in and, and pay pay a fee because we're still paying for it, but pay a fee that's much yeah. more reasonable for a New Zealand audience. Um, it's not the same as having them there, but it's it's a good second yeah. best. Um, and then we've got half a dozen animation voice actors from uh, the, one of the biggest lineup of animation guests we've had in the well, years um, that are coming yeah. in. And we've got all that set up. And that'll be the first... Um, I mean, we had some guests in 2020, but they're all... In New Zealand, this will be the first international guest we brought over, um, and then uh, we've got a couple of animation guests for June and July, and, and um, Toronga and uh, um, Toronga and Palms North, and virtual guests. And then October, ideally, we have a bunch of celebrity guests coming in because we're looking at that show as a celebrity-focused show instead of the esports okay. show. Instead of it's, it's next weekend isn't an esports show, but that's certainly a one of the many focuses that we're doing. But we're, again, we're trying to to mix and match what we're doing and how we're doing it so that it appeals to as wide an audience as possible. And at the moment, the response has been nothing short of overwhelming. So, cool. so how much? How's the pre-sale tickets going for the weekend? I mean, I know uh, like any venue that any event you're doing, you you know you don't know the numbers because there's a new one new date this time but everybody's aware of the name and yeah. what it's about how's the pre-sales yeah. tickets looking like uh, really well really well most of our Thanks. tickets sell the week of the show so i mean i can only go by where we were at last couple of times and we're right on track for that so i am I'm, I'm pretty happy with it i think i think we'll see a, i i think we're going to see a massive crowd this coming weekend so cool. well there is a real hunger to for people to get together again i mean like um it's you know, two years of just being isolated and not being able to hang out in big crowds. I mean, there are people that enjoy big crowds and big events, you know, and um, and and I, and sure enough, Armageddon has created that environment and has fed into that environment where it's good to be around lots of people and be sociable and not even, you know, like um, we mentioned that they're smaller groups, right? So yeah. they're smaller I groups think that of people that... Yeah, I think we might see so, people I mean, come and go on the show, but I, I think that that's a big part of what we're expecting. So, but it, yeah. it's like anything; it's we're taking a, we're always taking a risk doing any kind of shows, and more so in the the years around COVID. Um, but you know, I think I know this is going to go down really well. I know people are going to have a great time. So, I mean, I, I'm looking forward yeah. to it. So. Cool. All right, let's head back to the comics because that was a really cool uh, segue into. Um, into Armageddon, so we don't, have to, you know, I'm just looking forward to seeing, uh, you know, uh, I think the celebrity part of it is what I'm into and in, um, in the comic scene and stuff and probably as I get into anime, but more voice acting. So 
we we stopped at uh, I think it was Attica. We stopped at Attica. Let's well, move on to yeah. uh, let's say well, the time traveling tourists. Yeah, there's two. Well, there's two other sets of books that we do. Um, well, a, a side note to uh, Warden, we did a one break, which links into that book. So that was a fun thing to do too. I wrote that one by myself and did it. And didn't go quite the direction I wanted it to, but I was pretty happy with it overall. And it's been fun because the characters from that are in, um, in the new Warden volume. And so that was sort of a spin-off that became its sort of its way of introducing the characters. So um, the um, uh, we did two books from UK author Robert Rankin which was steampunk oriented, which is nice to do, but I'm not a huge fan of investing money into um, printing somebody else's stuff. Um, so we, we're not yeah. doing more of that, but great stuff and very talented, very talented and funny as fuck guy. Um, yeah. And then we started doing, I, I was working with uh, Richard Fairgrain. I came to him with a couple of core ideas and, and very yeah. much the ideas developed between the two of us. It was very much a, a a discussion that went both ways. And in the early stages of this, it's very much a 50-50, I would say sometimes more, sometimes less um, stage of writing where we would do the story and we'd send it back and he'd write some and I'd write some and it was it took a bit of time, but it was a good way to do it. And then um, the last, uh, last two books, definitely 100% the time travel, I mean, the new time travel tourist is 100% me. The, um, the but the last post apocalypse uh, was mostly me with a little bit of work from Richard. But again, it stands on the shoulders of everything we did. And Richard's very talented. He's over based in the states now, doing doing his own thing. Um, power tour. Yeah. Um, so we did a time traveling tourist, um, the Darwin fairies, and the Inspiration Duncans, and they're all three separate books. And I I sort of said that these are my versions of Iron Man, Thor, and Captain America, and then. I decided to do the Avengers, and then we did pre uh, pre apocalypse one and two, po um, um, now apocalypse and post apocalypse, um, right? Which is like four or five hundred pages of story featuring all the characters from those three books, and it was very yeah. satisfying. And once we'd done, I was like, "Well, we're done. This is it." And yeah. um, the time traveling tourist book was pretty much the most pop that and Darwin Fairies, the two most popular books we've done. We've sold. 1500 of each overall over the last 10 years which is not a lot but not a little um yeah and uh the i thought it'd be great to do another one of those so um worked on that with gonzalo martinez and uh, juan moraga as the colors and um and organized chaos was the, the end book and i'm very happy with it uh, it's it's a different tone to the original because the characters have moved further down the road um but again a uh, with with Beethoven Jones, who's the main character, I love that name. Um, yeah, the, he's a character that writes himself. You put him into any right. circumstance, and, and you know which direction he's going to go because there's there's certain aspects that he won't he'll he'll just won't take it seriously. Or yeah, uh, this is there's a bit of fun. I mean, he's a bit of a dick, but he doesn't mean yeah. it maliciously. But he's um, uh, and he takes things to heart, and he he. Takes things to heart, well, not, but for his mind, it's very much going through time and seeing dead people. So you don't have to, yeah. somebody dies on the Titanic, you don't weep for them because they've been dead for 100 years. Um, yeah. But and so he just enjoys himself. And it's a, it's a character that it's very freeing to write, and, and it was great revisiting him properly. And I'd like to do more, but at the moment, I'm, I'm in the warden headspace and I'm working on that actively. Yeah. So. So creatively, right? Because I mean, myself, I write comics as well. So creatively, how do you, um, you know, because you're so busy with Armageddon and stuff and all this yeah. other stuff, how do you find time to do this writing comic books and creating these characters? I've slowed down a bit over the last couple of years, um, but it's just prioritizing. Um, I try not to do a lot of Armageddon work over the weekends. And so if I'm doing writing, that's when it is. But I have to say that, like, Time Traveling Tourist 2, I did a bit of that like, over the last couple, over lockdowns and stuff. Um, but the uh, um, the Warden book has been on hold for three years, since the last, uh, three or four years since I've really picked it up. Because we've, I've been finishing, the, like, the book's been done, but I wrote that scripts for them years ago. Um, so re getting back into it late this last couple of weeks has been fun because I'm actively working on volume five because I want to 
finish the story. And that's um, that's one that'll be, it, it's been good getting back into it. But uh, you just have to separate yourself. I can't work on one thing and then, then click over to this. I'm not, I'm just not built that way. So I find okay. doing it on weekends where I can just disconnect is a much easier way to do it. So I had a, uh, I had a question there. For, I just, just went. So when you like, when you like, because your stories are very character orientated and very character driven, do you think that because of that, you enjoy writing it more or you're trying to, you know, or, or you're seeing it as, as an overall thing or how do you keep these characters in your head? You know, because you're trying to flash them out. So how do you actually, yeah, I'm trying to get this question right, but when no, you're I know playing, what you mean. With um, these, yeah. Uh, everybody's, everything's different. Some of them just don't. And it, it, a lot depends on the artist as well. You get, I get some responses where I just look at them and I go, it's not, it's not there. And then I get pages that just a hundred percent more the better than what I envisioned. Um, yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> he's not subtle. Yeah. I've a whole stack of hair on me before. Come on. Um, again, characters tell you, tell themselves, and a lot of the time, but it, it, that's how I, I envision it. I mean, you do have to build them up from a point, but it's um, it's very rare you, I've, I've written a character, or I feel like I've written a character that's doing something that I don't think they would do. Right. So um, let's talk about the fairies, uh, Darwin fairies. What hmm. is that story about? And what, you know, what is, uh, what sort of genre Someone, is that fitting into? It's pretty much Charles Darwin discovers fairies and um, teaches them survival of the fittest. And then they, they totally misunderstand what it actually means, what evolution is, and yeah. um, and just um, go from there. And then they've got very bureaucratic. They, again, there's certain rules that they follow. Um, it's just, it was a fun, it's a fun one to write. The, the, the whole, that whole series of books isn't supposed to be taken seriously. I mean, it's serious. It's got serious concepts in there, but it's designed to be just a funny. What's the What's the worst thing that can happen in the funniest way? Which is again yeah. why, like the first the, the first half dozen pages of a time traveling tourist is very much the 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 mentality. If you don't get the jokes in the first half dozen pages, you're just not going to get them. Um, right. And Darwin theories is the same. It's, it's what's What's a stupid thing that can happen with um, Scottish fighting pirate fairies? And that's one of the things I, I love about the fairies is because there's so much fairy lore. I mean, anytime you do any research on these kind of things, you go, oh, oh yeah. people picture the fairies as the, the fairies in the garden or the, you know, this little thing or Guillermo del Toro's ones with big teeth and, and stuff. And you go, yeah. you know, why did you can do anything with them? Because there isn't a lot of solid lore that says this yeah. is what a fairy is. Don't don't go any there. It's, it's like vampires. Yeah. You can have sparkly X Men vampires, or you can have normal vampires, and then sometimes some yeah. stuff in between. Yeah, and the, the fairies were great. I, I took took them what they want, added some characteristics to them, and said this is what they are, and we just went with that. And it's been fun. They were fun to do. And I so based it's kind a of bunch like the, of those. Then Patrick from the book is based on my son, Violet of the Fae. I mean, my daughter, Violet, is 100% that character. I mean, she's not Violet of the Fae. Violet, <laughs> Violet of the Fae is a five-star bitch. But, um, but she's drawn to follow my daughter. Um, and I got yeah. her in a costume, and we went to Comic-Con, and she actually did a Violet of the Fae cosplay at Comic-Con, which was a awesome. hoot. Um, so this, so. Is, this is um, another thing that I enjoy about um, – because when I bought when I bought my first issue of um, the warden, mm. there was a couple of people dressed up as the warden there. Yeah, you know? and, yeah, we and, had a couple um, of things. There. It's, been, it's been nice to be able to invest a bit of that in um, the yeah. um, to to do stuff through the show. That there was a good way to do it. I mean, look, the books have been they're a fun side project for me. I would like them. To be more than what they are, and and some for some people they very much are. I, I, got, um, I was wearing a warden shirt, and I was at a petrol station a few years back, and a guy recognised it, and I was like blown away that it was something that was just off the cuff. He recognised, and I thought that was great. 
Um, and and certainly running our own convention, it's great to have our own my own characters I can use. So I don't have to worry about Marvel saying don't use Spider Man on our on your poster. I can go well, I put the warden up there. Don't worry about it. Um, exactly. So that that, yeah. that aspect, like how like how was it dealing with um, you know your competitive kind of thing? Because now you've got your own convention, able to sell your own products. Uh, you know products being comic books, creations that you've created mm. as a nerd, right? Because this is coming out of you years and years of being well, part of the fandom. It, it does make things a little easier in some respects. I mean, it, it's a bit of self-promotion, but it's also sometimes it's just easier. You go, I need to use a superhero. Great. I've got a superhero or I've got artists to draw something for me and get it done. It, it, as a big event, it does make it a lot easier. If we were an American event, I mean, you can do it. It's just always nice to be, not have to worry about getting a phone call from Disney. So, I mean, they're pretty hard on, on the legal side of things. So the next one... Um, I don't I know. I, I, I tend to avoid it where I can, so... Right. So the next one, let's talk about the inspiration of Duncan's. Yeah. Um, and tell me about, the, about that book and how that came about. Well, that was one of the earlier ones, and um, it was very much a book based around uh, let's uh, if the world what if the world ends and there was just a couple of idiots who were sort of they did it by accident and then tried to fix it, um, and the idea at the end was that they don't fix it that the world is still pretty much uh, it's almost yeah. a, uh, a Shaun of the Dead ending the way we sort of end it, um, yeah, but. Uh, and that, that was fun. It, it, it's not the best of the books that we put out. I, I, it's an enjoyable one, a little bit of toilet humor, but it's it's one of the biggest ones. So um, we actually did uh, a hardcover, um, and then we um, edited it and added about half a dozen new pages to it and then re reissued it. And it's one of those ones where um, we... I feel better about the, the the George Lucas version, which has just added a bit to it and fleshed it out. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it, but that we did that to a degree to make it fit into where Duncan's are. and the characters from that fit into the pro apocalypse saga really well. I mean, they they drive that whole thing, and it's very much their saga and the Darwin fairies and Time Travel Tourists appear in it. Um, because their, fin their story finishes at the end, although one of the characters moves into the new book. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's very much uh, a little more juvenile than some of the other ones. There's a, there's a toilet joke in there somewhere. Um, but it, yeah. it's a fun book. So with, with uh, Beyond Reality Media, the, the comic book side of things, is this universe... Oh, singular universe that these, these characters are in? They live in the same universe? Or are they like just, you know, peripheries? No, the, those three books, The Darwin Fairies, Time Traveling Tourists, and um, uh, uh, Inspiration Duncans are all in the same true. universe. Attica and Warden right. technically are in the same universe. Um, but uh, but we did a, did a crossover there because I thought it would be funny. But um, beyond that, we haven't really dabbled too much. But the, the original one, um, those three books – very much they're set up to be a, a one sort of big story. All right. So I got my question that I was thinking about earlier that lost, you know, got lost in a thing. So it's when you started the, you know, writing these books, did you think mm -hmm. there would be 400 pages on that one title? You know, when no, you first no. started? Or did you think Here's a general story. We'll, yeah. Here's a general story. We'll go with this. This will be fun. I mean, anybody who anybody who starts writing, oh, I'm going to write my grand opus and it's going to be a thousand pages long, is is just deluding themselves or a giant wanker. Um, Crunchy, go off, okay, over there. Um, it, it's no, it, 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 but again, the characters tell you where they want to go, and um, right. the original story was this, this, and this. And then I thought, once we did the second, once we were working on Darwin Fairies, I got the idea to combine them in. And so the Inspiration Duncans are a big part of the last third, last third of the Darwin Fairies. Yeah. And then they're a minor part in the Time Traveling Tourist. 
um, except for the, until the last page. And and then once we did that, it was like, well, now we can do a story where they're all together, and and it came from there. But it's also a lot of that. Those three books is me and Richard Fairgrave just hit bouncing off each other to get to where we want because we had so many different ideas that we threw away um, that we thought yeah. this would be a great one, and 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 then it's just you talk a bit. I come up with a great idea, and he comes back and says that's a stupid idea, and you realize it is, and vice versa. Um, that was one of the advantages of doing. Some, some, most of the books in a partnership with somebody else. It had helped to thread out some of the, the less good stuff that we could have done. And not, not that everything that we did has been great, but it's, um, but I'm, I'm pretty happy with all the books overall. Yeah. So my ne next question is how do you work with co writers? Because I don't, I don't have co writers myself. So mm -hmm. how do you yourself, you know, working with co writers who are around the world? Like, I mean, you're, Christians overseas and, um, you know, your artists are overseas well, and so on. Richard, but like Richard was here. Richard was here when we were doing it. We would just meet up and go spend half the noon doing stuff. Um, I think yeah. the first time I met up with him, I was in a hotel room. We just talked and talked through that. Um, yeah. When I've dealt with Christian, it's very much been when he's been here or we do a phone call or a, or I do it when I was in America. And that's why a lot of that Warden and Attica stuff, the latest stuff I've written mostly by myself, but it's been based on, original concept we discussed um yeah but uh i mean with richard when we moved to la we haven't done anything since because it's, it's just it's not not set up for it um and also i am feeling a lot more confident and uh, you learn a lot doing it that way there's there's advantages yeah. to being with somebody else and just going um okay particularly when you start you know anybody can write a comic anybody can write a comic doesn't mean it's going to be a good comic yeah. And certainly, yeah. again, a lot of my core ideas would sucked. Um, and that's yeah. the advantage of having a partner in there. And, and and you also need to make sure that you can work with each other because sometimes you can deal with people that are a little more, this is my idea and I'm not going to compromise. And, and you need yeah. to be able to adjust. So um, where, where, where from here? Because, like, you guys are releasing, what's the new book that you're releasing right now, which is the final one? I mean, latest um, ones, you're saying, not the fun ones. Time Traveling Tourist Organized Chaos is the book that's coming out next week. Um, we've had that for a while right. now, so it's been it's good to get it finally out. And then uh, The Warden, uh, The Cultivation of Chaos, Warden Volume 4, will be out um, in uh, probably, I would hopefully, Tauranga. Um, that could be later in the year. Depends on what shipping's like, because shipping times are crazy at the moment. So, um so, yeah, I mean, onwards. and then Warden Volume Five will be the next one, and that'll be next year sometime. And I'm working on that, writing that at the moment. Now, you, because you're at your events and you have your books at your events, do you put a time aside for when you come down and you, you know, out of the whole lot where you go half an hour? Now I'm going to be there to sign the books, or do you actually? have that moment you know like us comic fans always want our signatures right yeah i so i tend to be if somebody wants me to come back and sign i, I stop at the stand pretty regularly if somebody wants me to sign something i'll come back but i, I don't tend awesome. to set up a signing time primarily because the, the big problem with me doing anything at the show is that i need to be flexible and, and putting a time aside sometimes is really hard to do so i try to avoid it but I, I'll, I'll always pop back and if somebody wants something signed i'll i'll get it done um it's nice it's fun to do but um, it's yeah. uh, it, it's uh, I've done that a bit at Comic Con. We've done a few where I've signed the books and we've sold a bunch there, and that that, that was fun. More so because that was really the only time I've really stayed on the area and done stuff. Except last time for right. one of the days, I disappeared to go to the Freddie Whitaker Doctor Who panel, which you know was was fun to do. So let's let's talk about like actual management of Armageddon, right? Now that we've segued into that, so let's say um, on the day, you, you, there's so much happening, so many uh, organized chaos, you, you know, as we like to say, it, that's happening. How do you keep on top of that because of what's going on all over the place? Have you, like, because you've grown up in the last 27 years to get to this point now with six events, and some of them you've closed down, right, because it didn't work out or for whatever, like Hamilton. Um, you put it started and then stop. How did you, you know, what are these management skills that you can pass on to people or, you know, that you've learned in that time? Um, well, I mean, by the time we get to the show, I, to be honest, I'm just putting out little fires. I don't 
most of all the staff are doing their own thing. Every most of the stuff I'm not actively involved with. I, I, the bigger the show, the more you need people in control of things. So if you right. you try to stand there like a ringmaster, you're just going to fail because uh, that's what I did early days. And there's a point when you spill hot coffee over yourself halfway through a show, you realize you're doing too much. Um, yeah, yeah that's, <laughs> that's a fun one. Um, you just just sit back and you go, look, I need to somebody to handle staff, somebody to handle this, somebody to handle that. And most people are better that way. They don't want somebody standing over them. And, and I'm I'm more inv actively involved in the preparation and then right. just keeping an eye on things during the show. Hmm. So if you were giving a TED talk, right? Mm -hmm. This is Bill giving a TED talk and uh, what would you be, you know, say you got 10, five minutes to do your whole thing and um, in your in your universe, which is the, you know, expos, working with celebrities, working with, um, you know, all these different people, what would your TED, TED talk be about? Make sure that you have good people under you and that you give them your support. You know, I mean, you can second guess people all you like, but all that does is undermine them. You need to make sure that you're giving them as much support as you can, but also just the confidence. And a lot of the time, it's just sitting back and going, look, you're in charge, where you go. It took me a long time to learn that because I fucked that up a few times. But um, yeah. it's uh, uh, the, even if people aren't doing the best that you'd hope them to do, they're doing the best they can do. And uh, sometimes you're expecting too much. Um, but most, virtually all, all of the people that I work with now, I, I, you know, I just leave them to it and they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing better than I could do it. So second guessing them just doesn't help. As an event, or as an event so, organizer, so, anyway. Yeah. Over the last 27 years, as um, Armageddon has grown, where do you, uh, you know, with the ignoring the last two years, where did you expect you'd be now? You know, if, if <laughs> nothing happened in the last two years. No expectations. Yeah. No expectations yeah. of where we would be now. I, 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 absolutely none. I, I didn't expect we would be doing this full time. I didn't, I mean, we made that decision nearly. 18 years ago, 19 years ago, we moved to doing this full time. That was a risk. Doing more bigger shows, didn't expect that. I mean, honestly, again, like writing a book, sometimes the story just takes you where it's going to take you. Um, and some yeah. things we will have gone, okay, we can do this, let's do it. Um, and other things you've just gone, yeah, we don't, we don't need to do anything. Um, it's, uh, you know, every, everything works pretty well. Um, but I, I definitely didn't plan where we're at now. I didn't, never planned on hosting actors, never planned on having, traveling internationally to meet some of them, never planned on animation, never planned on comics, never planned on Japanese guests, yeah. never planned on wrestling. These things that they come to you and you just, you can either go, yeah, let's do that or not. And that's probably, that's maybe the credit I can take where we've gone, okay, let's try it. You know, I'm normally yeah. pretty good about trying new things. Uh, but I'm also all of that stuff is dependent on people helping, people setting it up, the talent being in time, the you know, and, and the right thing, and make and it working, and then the attendees and the public going, yeah, this is something you want to see. It's 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 I, I, I can I can take some credit for for success we had, but I can also take all of the credit for the blame for anything we've done wrong. So yeah, you know, whereas there's a lot of stuff that uh, that has gone right at the show, and that's always because of the, um, the staff and the, the, the people who've helped us out to get to that point. That's all virtually, you know, they're the ones making a lot of that happen because they're the doing, the doing the actual work. Okay. So talking about staff, how many do you uh, employ full-time, casual, part-time as part of Armageddon? There's about half a dozen of us full-time. Yeah. Um, and then at the shows, we go from 20 to 40 people on average. So, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, yeah. But we're dedicated things. And there's extra people we bring in to do other things for us. And there's always new stuff we're looking at. I'm, I'm looking, working on a new thing at the moment, which I, I can't talk about. But um, if sure. that comes through in about a month or so, we'll have a new announcement for a whole different thing that people won't even see coming. Um, so there's always new stuff. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the opportunities that we have now because in the last two years, we've had time to sit down and really think about what we want to do. 
you know, uh, because last, last two years have pretty years. much been, yeah, last two years have been survival. I mean, I'm happy to all change. I'm happy to all grow stuff and we've taken some risks and we've been able to keep going. But uh, honestly, any company that's still around is that success. Anybody who's around after COVID, it's, and, and that's not a governmental thing. That's just a, a reality. It's a worldwide thing. The, 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 everywhere in the world, some some people have thrived, some people have starved, and and we're an event during we're an event company during a, a pandemic, which is not the worst thing you could be, but not one of the best. Um, yeah. And just surviving it has been a, a minor miracle, and the fact that we're doing okay at the moment is 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 the best part. Now, last year there was you know you guys uh, because. There was a whole, what is it? I don't know if it's in the US, they call it PP, whatever, um, with the COVID bailout thing. So there was a situation there where you guys asked for that because of what had happened. Now, we talked about earlier, right? Because you know, people don't take into context the, the amount. We said that Armageddon alone brings in $14 million to the, to the Auckland economy. Now, mm -hmm. and you guys basically work with so much, so much um, uh, money and stuff. Then the question was, well, why why does Armageddon need need a bailout because of that? So, what would your answer? Well, we didn't, be, right? We, we didn't I, get we didn't get any kind of bailouts or anything like that at all. Uh, we got the wage subsidy, yeah. which was I mean, what everybody else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. excellent in the sense that people are aware of that now. You know, kind of thing. People, you know, because people well, get it, like it sound bites. You know, sound yeah. bites really doesn't I, help I, I anybody. Speak to those, and that there's some people who that that's the way they want to read things that they're going to read no matter what we say badly. The only uh, governmental support that we got during the show, uh, we applied for a couple of grants, didn't get anything. Um, right. But the only governmental support that we got uh, specifically was the wage subsidy, and that was. When we were in lockdown and we couldn't do anything, I mean, we weren't. We were actively telling people not to pay us any money because we didn't know if we were doing shows, and in some cases we yeah. didn't. So um, yeah. that's you know that we kept. We didn't lose any staff. We didn't reduce anybody's pay. Um, yeah, you know, and that's six hundred bucks a week per person. So it's not like a zillion dollars. Um, we got. Uh, the government MBIE uh, insurance claim for um, cancelled shows, but yeah. that doesn't pay. That doesn't pay us. That just covers the costs of of, of our um, uh, the companies that we use and money that yeah. we would have spent already. So, you know, yeah. uh, this means I'm not a lot of uh, the problem with TV. Right, the problem with TV is you've got thirty seconds to say what you need to say, and that's it. I, 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 like I was watching an interview the other day, they had a very important person being interviewed, right? Well, very important thing. And they had to be cut off because the time ran out. When you're talking to someone like us, you know, like podcasting, you get time to explain and, you know, say what's actually happened. So you don't get that 30 seconds where there's misunderstanding to the public. And I, and I find that really um, horrible in the sense that, okay, this is Bill. This is what Bill did. And now, sorry, sorry, that's all we got time for, Bill. You know, yeah. So uh, hearing you say exactly what happened, it's awesome. People read into what they want to read. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, um, if you um, if you do maths, most companies got bugger all. They got the weight subsidy was a very helpful thing for a lot of companies, but particularly when you're there's no revenue coming in, and for us, our core cost was staffing, um, but we had other costs yeah. that we weren't that that didn't help. And we managed to make it work, um, yeah. but we're we're an event company during a pandemic. So um, whenever the way the only time the wage subsidy was normally um, given out was when we were in lockdown. So you know, we weren't doing shows then. We weren't making money then, and you also had to follow certain criteria, and we we followed all of those. So yeah, I'm not I'm not worried about that side of it. And compared to a bulk of companies we didn't take, we didn't really get that much. So, I mean, with six staff, we're not claiming for, you know, a thousand staff and then saying, oh, we, we actually made a profit, but we're going to keep this money anyway. We have, we have six staff, which is, you know, 3,600 a week in wage subsidy at best. So, yeah. yeah. 
and these are talented people as well. I mean, because like we said, you bring in 40 only, and this is just one event, $40 well, million that, that's, dollars that's, to the, to the industry. Side, yeah, and open. That's a side of thing. There's, there's lots of companies that generate a lot of revenue that, that might not have got help. Um, but I think most companies got crunchy, just like away. Most countries, most companies got the wage subsidy. Um, companies that got beyond that, I don't know, we didn't. So, you know, um, but uh, that, that's, that's the last two years. It's just getting, getting through the last two years has been the fun part. So. Okay. All right. So we're almost done with almost up to two hours now, which is what I promised uh, with you. But, um, Let's let's pitch next weekend, and uh, and then I'll finish up with your final words, because you've got your event on the, you know, and like it's, we discussed, um, October not, not happened, and so we need a lot of people to go to the event next, you know, next Saturday people and Sunday. Want to come. Now, is it a two day event? It's a two and a half. Two and a half. I mean, we're, we're Saturday. Sorry, it's Friday night. Mm -hmm. so Saturday's nine until nine. So it's a full twelve hour show, which we've never done before, um, okay. and full day. Time. So it's two and a half, two and a half days, but um, or what was it 20, 24 hours for the show? Mm. I think over the three days. What, so what's the cost of the event? I mean, what's the cost of attendees to attend it? I think it's uh, twenty nine dollars for an adult. Um, children are free if they're coming in with an adult. I mean, you, you can one adult can bring in three kids, no problems. You still need to get yeah. a ticket for them. But the tickets are free. Um, and uh, that's a thing that we haven't done before, or haven't done for a long time. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking that. Like, this is the, this is quite different uh, in the sense that before it was like, okay, adult they pay as well because they get a chance. But having that, is this because of COVID that you decided to actually make it free for kids this year? I mean, for this event? Uh, there's, a, there's a couple and what's of the reasons. Age? Uh, and what's 12, the age there? Twelve and under. Mm -hmm. So right, it's, you know, yes. primary school. Um, yeah, it's just a, there's a couple of reasons behind it. It just it worked out that we could do it, so we did. And um, it's working based on the numbers so far, working pretty well. So um, it, it, a lot of families and a lot of people struggling. I mean, they want to spend money at the show. I, I think they'll end up seeing people who, instead of paying for the kids to come in, will just spend that money at the show, um, which is great for our exhibitors. Yeah. And also means yeah, that you get to walk around. So. And, and that's, a, that's another kind of thing that people, you know, there is that um, there's a circle, there's a benefit to the community, there's a benefit to the attendees, uh, and also the you know the commerce of having people come and be there. And I think this is a joy of being part of something that which you guys are doing at a higher level compared to all the smaller ones that have popped up over the you know over the last couple of years. Well, the and, smaller um, shows are great. I mean, don't I don't want to disparage them at all. They're wonderful to have. And they're um, yeah. they're servicing a, a portion of the community that that, um, that there's obviously a need that we can't do. Yeah. I, mean, I said I was at the the Christchurch Geek Market and there's the Kawai Cosplay Fest um, that's on, um, and those kind of events target a specific audience and deliver better than what we could do because it's the pure stuff, right? right? But um, whereas Armageddon is much more, it's a bigger community. But there's right. options that you get otherwise. Yeah, really. I mean, like a, a smaller uh, a smaller event couldn't get someone like John Barrowman because the cost. Yeah, but that, that's just, just economies of, of, yeah. of um, scale, really. That that's all that is. I mean, look, and they're not. But a small a fan event or a again, I, 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 I we're big enough that I worry. I've got to watch what I say because I don't want to offend anybody in that area. Okay. Those shows are great. Yeah. You should go to them if you see them. Okay, they need your support, and, right. and they grow. And ideally, the the more support you give them, the bigger they grow. But there's there's the problem with getting bigger is that you um, you need more to keep you going. And that's right. um, you know, you get John Barrowman to a show, and that's great. But you need to you need to have the capital to make that work, and that's not something the small event can do. Now, right. some can, and New Zealand is a very different market. It always has been. I mean, the New Zealand market yeah. is very different to Australia. Um, there's a lot less cash on the street here in terms of what people will spend. Um, yeah. And historically, we're more, way more affordable than most. I mean, we do autographs here, 30 to $60, sometimes a little more. 
um, that are sixty to a hundred dollars overseas. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. So it, it's it, it's we're always adjusting, but uh, but yeah, that's it. If, if there's a there's a general if there's a pop culture event in your city or even outside the city and you can support it, go. It, you, the the more more people that go to those, the better and. and Get from what get from it what you will, and if you want to do more, if you want to start your own thing, if you want to grow something, do it. Yeah. it it's not it's not that hard to start one of these things. The hard part is maintaining yeah. it and building it. Anybody right. can do. I'm going to save up, spend a hundred bucks to get a community hall, and I'm going to do yeah. a horror event, and I'll invite some of my friends, and we'll do a thing. You can do that. It's not that's not the hard part. It's making it look good. Yeah. And getting yeah. it out there and, and going further than that, but we're in an age where Place Me does some support, and there's um, and you can get and social makes it a lot, a lot easier to do, but also harder because you're fighting with other people. But honestly, I'm talking yeah. out of uh, these 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 other events are uh, my hats off to them. I, I think that they're they're everybody's struggling to do anything, and the fact that doing anything is great. Um, but it's but it's the- every the challenges to make these things work. Um, the probably other the biggest thing is that this is, committees. Yeah, the other thing is that you started there as well. You started in the town hall. I mean, you know, yeah. town hall or what it was, you know. And um, and now free, because free you've been able to free Bay Community Center. Yeah. Right. So, sorry, what was it again? Freeman's Bay Community Center. Still there. Still free. looks exactly the same from what I can see. Um, great yeah. little venue. We did so, a small I mean, mini thing there. So. And this is the thing about the history of Armageddon is that you came out of put, being a fan of Doctor Who, uh, you know, putting on events like that, and then slowly keeping it going and having the um, the backing of others. Now you're at this stage where you you know six shows a year, possible. And um, and I know, I, I mean, I love it. I mean, my first experience like it was a 2007, 2009. I was a part of it with part of um. You know what was Gotham Comics with Jeremy Bishop. You know, I mm-hmm. I got to put a little you know little uh, comic, and uh, I think it's, yeah, you know, I got to put this up there in his little you know book, and I was able to have my comic in there, a couple of pages, and be there at the stand, and then um, meet Peter David, who was sent right next to me, mm-hmm. and Greg Rucker, yeah. right. Who are, yeah. Greg Rucker was awesome, you know. He had just done White, uh, his movie, uh, uh, White. Oh God, gosh, I can't remember. I know, now. I know the one. The, the um, the yes, the, the one that was filmed in yeah, New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, you know, I read the book. Book's great. But yeah, Greg, Greg's an and interesting often, one. Uh, he actually had a bit of his stuff made into film. I mean, more so than most. Um, which yeah. is you know an accomplishment itself. And it's it's like it's like, it should have been a cult classic, but like people not aware of how good that is. And I love Greg Rucker, you know, and and he he was very personable, you know. And I say, and, and I said, I'm just writing comics. He said, and I asked him a question about, you know, the movie, right? Uh, you've just had your um, um, comic book made into a movie, so how do you feel about that? How much control on that? And, he, and I said, and he said to me, um, you know, the movie's the movie. I write comics. My story is my comic. That's my story. And as a movie, whatever they do with the movie, that's a movie. And I thought that's very professional of him to do that because I have a, I went to school. I've got a film degree, so that's what mm. was the question I asked because I was like, how do you you know, you know, when we were talking about earlier about yeah, this is my thing. I'm not going to let go of my thing. You know, you got that when when you're working with a co-creator, that sort of thing. And having Peter David there, who's like ultra more superhero, you know, writing the whole and all this stuff, and him being totally different to Greg, you know, it's like he's always, Peter Davis had yeah, taken notes about what he's going to do. Right and, and, and I appreciate because you're obviously very, and we've talked about this a bit, you're obviously very mm-hmm. enthused about the, the uh, guests, which is mm-hmm. great. From my experience, though, um, and what we've seen certainly over the last couple of years, um, we that audience that is very guest orientated is um, is a portion of the audience, but a bulk of the right. audience just wants to come to the show, and and that's why we've been investing in gaming and entertainment stuff at the event because we get a lot of people that are into that. Um, it's trying to make it, and and 
we're finding with, from a guest perspective, it's still, we're, things are still very much up in the air. We don't know who's traveling, who's not, who wants to do stuff. Mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, and again, things are all is different. And costs are changing all the time. And the exchange rate has dropped 15% since the last time we hosted physical guests, and that doesn't help. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, every, it's just something to keep in mind that while guests are great, you know, I'm, and yeah. I'm for me, it is one of the highlights of hosting people is being able to see behind the cloud, uh, the the curtain. Um, it's it is a part of the show, not the show itself. Right. It's just it's just it's the it's the thing that does separate it from just the normal uh, some other things, um, and it's why it'll always be part of the show. Um, but it always evolves, and it has done. And we'll probably be doing some virtual and some physical stuff in, in tandem. Yeah. I would say. But I'm definitely at Christchurch and Wellington. We've got about half a dozen celebrity guests planned for that one. We're just and that's physical, not not virtual. But we've also got some virtual coming in. So, yeah. Well, talking about guests, uh, you know, and the difference between that because a lot of people don't know, wouldn't know them, right? Unless they're in their fandom. So I would know. Well, the yeah, one, one person. People... Says, oh my god! I can't believe that person's here. Is another person. Who the hell is that? Um, yeah. Everybody's different. That respect and, and and I get that. and talent gets that too and there's some that that everybody knows. I mean, look, if Mark Hamill's agent contacted me tomorrow and said he wants to do a show, I'm gonna fucking make that happen. But it's <laughs> yeah. not something that you know, doesn't happen very easily, and that that generally doesn't happen. So, all right. So in finishing, I'm gonna put you on solo, and you can say whatever you want. To uh, you know promote um Armageddon and three three to five minutes, and we'll finish up with that, and I'm. You know, even with that, thank you for your time, Bill. I think uh, you know, I've, it's awesome to um, be able to take, have you take two minutes, two hours of your time with this hoe coming up with thousands of people in attendance, guests, uh, events like uh, esports, um, the you know the anime side, and the also the you know the, all the um, small businesses that are involved, big businesses that are involved, and especially uh, you know like Xbox and all that. So I'll give you, you know, finishing off in, with, you know, as a final say, and uh, we'll finish after that. I'll come back and we'll say our goodbyes and thanks. And but I just really want to say thank you right now for the time that you've given us. Um, look, we've got show our event on uh, the Auckland show on next weekend or whenever. You, I mean, maybe this weekend if you listen depends on when you're listening to this. Um, this is crunchy, by the way. A little bit of melanoma on his nose, but. Anyway. Um, Come to the show. It's it's, it's for uh, there's a lot of smaller exhibitors that um, and bigger ones that that need your support, and this event means a lot to them. From a community perspective, it's a great place to be, and we put a lot of energy into this one more so than pretty much any Auckland show we've ever done. And, and I'm looking genuinely looking forward to people seeing it. There's, there's some great stuff that we've never done before. Um, got a couple of physical big ships we brought in and. Um, and some bigger displays and lighting and, and prop displays and just, just things that we really, I think, are going to work. And the eSports stage is going to look amazing, and if that works, then it's something we can take further and do more with over the years as well. Um, so come to that. And if you're into comics, and hopefully you're watching this, well, um, my new Time Traveling Tourist 2 book is out, and I'm um, happy to sign that for you, or you should buy more of the others. Step on the keyboard, crunchy, or you just connect me. Um, but uh, uh, and support there'll be New Zealand comic characters there and Drawfest and others there so if you can support them that's great too because they every every person who buys a comic is supporting the industry and, and the industry needs every little bit you can get because um, New Zealand comics is a hard thing to to really reach out properly because budget wise there's not a lot of money for promotion um, I'm fortunate I used my show to help my books, but I also try to use it as much as we can to promote the local industry. So uh, more support you can give them, the better. Uh, one of our um, New Zealand comics uh, greats, um, Jason Lenny, who pushes, um, not pushes, sorry, print this, prints, um, is it not fun time? Where is it? These two. Yeah, it is fun time. Sorry, my bad. It's fun time. And he, last year they put out um, um, Pandemania. Which I had a bit in, and so, like you said, it's supporting New Zealand um, comics because it's really hard to, uh, you know, to be able to uh, promote what is, uh, you know. We mentioned a little bit about the whole full-time jobs that 
Kiwis have, and they do comics on the side, so they don't able to put uh, as much effort into yeah. working with it's other really people. So we find that extra time to do it. So. Yeah, so it's basically on the side. So thank you, and like you said, Drawfest is going to be there. You're going to have a whole bunch of artist alley stuff, and not only just those guys, but you've got all these other uh, things that I look at, like um, Asian anime and manga artists. You know, that do their own thing as well. Toy, toys. Uh, you know, uh, people who create soft toys, all those other things, uh, creative set that come out there. And um, so, thank you, Bill. I appreciate what you do with Armageddon, uh, and I'm thank you for taking the time to explain certain things and also talking about the comics that you create and the backgrounds about these awesome books and you know that i've enjoyed i love i love the warden um it's mm. you know sometimes you know you can you can read a book and not really get it and sometimes you can get it right away and i think and i love the idea that you have of these books because they're and it's it's kind of interesting like seeing how you as a you know bits of you are in all these books you know and you kind of come across and you got your fantasy you got your superhero uh you got your uh, time traveling everything that a nerd always thinks about as you know when they're reading comic books and so thank you for your time is there anything else you want to say before we finish off here no like just you um, myself up. be kind have fun enjoy yourself uh, i mean that's just don't just uh, come in a group if you can um see some friends but Honestly, anything you can support in this in the pop culture industry in the world. There's local stores you can visit. There's, um, there's our events, there's smaller events. There's social stuff. It's all, all good. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Uh, thank you, um, Bill. And um, we'll see you next time. Kakite uh, ano. And um, wherever you are, be well, be safe.